Okay, we have shut the doors, so let's get started. My name is Brian McDonald. I'm an editor with the Pragmatic Bookshelf. If you've heard of the Pragmatic Publisher, or the Pragmatic Programmer, that's us. Um, so I'm going to be talking about continuous learning for developers. Now, a lot of this is aimed at developers. That's why I put it in the title. So I'm going to be talking about learning code. However, a lot of this stuff, the techniques I'm going to talk about, also apply to if you want to learn uh, a framework, or if you want to learn Azure, or if you want to learn something like Agile, you can apply all this stuff. One thing I want to mention up front, I'm going to be talking mostly about practical things, things that you can take away and do right now. There's a little bit of learning theory in here, but not a lot. So I want to make that clear up front. And I also want to mention what's called the law of two feet. So if anything I've just said doesn't appeal, or if anything during the talk doesn't appeal to you, and you think something might serve you better, please feel free to get up and go search out something that works better for you. That's just politeness at a conference, but that's also foreshadowing that's going to come back at the end of the talk. OK. Who's seen this quote before? A few. Learn one new language every year. This is by Andy Hunt and Dave Thomas. It's from the Pragmatic Programmer. I've already mentioned that's my employer. And this is a great thought. That's the way it was intended. And developers, being engineers and having that sort of engineer mindset, immediately translated this into, I must learn one new entire programming paradigm every 365 days, or Andy and Dave will come to my house and take my programmer card. That's not quite true. I checked with Andy. He said, if you need another week or maybe 10 days to get it done, then kidding. No, what I mean is, if you look in the book where this quote comes from, which I think is page 14, the heading on that page is goals. All right? This is an aspiration. This is something that we should aspire to, not take literally, but it's also something that we can't ignore. New frameworks appear all the time. New languages appear all the time. Bandwidth increases. Hardware changes. Moore's law is always catching up to us. So we need to keep learning all the time. So that's the point of this talk. I want to help you maximize the learning that you get out of the time and effort that you put in. And the first big takeaway I want you to have from this talk is to think of your education as an investment. This is an investment in your productivity at work. It's an investment in your team. It's an investment in your career. It's an investment in your life. In other words, just like all investments, take it seriously. A lot of people think, you know, I'm going to try and fit in some learning in a few minutes at my lunch hour or maybe on my commute. That's not the most effective way of going about it. If you want to improve your physical fitness and you said, well, I'm going to, you know, exercise for five minutes every day when I get a chance, you're not going to see great long-term results. You want to come up with a program, commit to a program, stick with it, follow it through, and then you'll see the results that you want. And the same thing goes with education. Now, with that said, I do understand that your time and your resources are limited, and I'm going to help you make the best of what you've got. So start with motivations, because motivations affect your learning. Why do we do continuing education? Most common reason, we have to do it for work. All right? My team has made a decision that we're going to port the site from JavaScript to TypeScript, so now everybody needs to learn TypeScript. Sometimes that decision doesn't come internally from your team. Sometimes it comes down from above. That's a special case. I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Career development is another reason. Maybe you, you know, there's that other team in the company that you think they have more fun, so you'd like to work for them. They're doing the mobile app, and you don't know Swift, so you need to learn Swift. Or maybe you want to make a vertical move to a different company. The, uh, the term polyglot programmer was one we used to hear a lot. I haven't heard it much lately. But you know, basically, it translates to, I know a lot of languages. So having more than one on your resume, good for your career prospects, whether vertically or laterally. And finally, personal enrichment. Right? You just want to get better at what you do. I want to think differently. 
I don't know about all of you, but I learned as an object-oriented programmer. Started in C++, learned some functional languages later on. And my experience has always been that when folks go from object-oriented to functional, suddenly all the problems that they're having at work look like they have functional solutions. I can't promise that every single one does, but it certainly seems if you talk to functional programmers who enjoy their work, they'll tell you that it does. I'm not sure if every problem has a functional solution or if that's just a side effect. It's a little functional humor for you there. Um, but in addition to training your brain differently, you, know, you might just want to do something for fun. I brought these guys on the slide because most programmers I know have at some point had a desire to write a game. Who here wants to write a game? Yeah, that's what I thought. Has anybody actually done it? Cool, excellent. So you probably had to learn a new language to do it, right? Or, or a new framework, or you have to learn Unreal or Unity, or if you want to make a mobile game, Swift. All right. So I'm talking about the motivations first, because here's your second big takeaway. The key to continued learning is engagement. And I don't mean this engagement. I just can't resist a Picard slide. I mean this engagement. Engagement is the state that happens when your desire to learn meshes with the content that you've got and meshes with your environment to create an optimal learning situation. Because the optimal learning situation is what we're shooting for here. Who's familiar with the zone, being in the zone? Has anybody experienced it? Not necessarily at work, but just in general, athletics or whatever? Excellent. Who's experienced it while writing code? Cool. Good crowd. Thanks for participating. So when you're in the zone, things are easy. Hard things have immediately presented solutions. Difficult things start to seem simpler than they would otherwise. You can be in the zone while learning. The things that you want to learn seem to come easier. The problems seem to dissolve in front of you. But what a lot of us do by not taking learning seriously is we put obstacles in our way that don't need to be there. And the obstacles are what prevent you from getting in the zone and staying there. So that's what this talk is mostly about, how to avoid those obstacles. We'll start with the easy stuff, the externals. And some of this is going to seem obvious, but think about how often you let these things get in your way anyway. So we'll start with the physical needs, all right? If you're going to learn, don't be too hungry. Maybe don't eat right, try to learn right after lunch either. Don't be too tired. Don't be in physical pain. I know this is one of the ones that says, oh, that's really obvious, right? If I just broke my leg, I'm not going to sit down and read a textbook. But how many times have, you know, maybe in your school career, have you tried to hammer your way through a chapter while you had a splitting headache? Right? People do that because I got to get this done. If you're investing, and I'm not saying that, you know, if you have a headache, you should automatically put it away because sometimes you don't have that choice. But why try and learn with a splitting headache if you don't have to? Think about your location. Some people like to study at home. Some people like to study at a library. Uh, I personally recommend natural light if you can get it, unless you're one of those folks who is a night owl. Ambient noise is also something to consider when you're thinking about location. I personally like to study in a silent room. I blame my parents and their homework rules for that. Other folks like a little bit of background noise because it helps to cut down on distractions. It's white noise. So maybe studying in a coffee shop is better for them. And the most important of these externals is time. Getting into the zone is not instantaneous. Unless you're a professional elite athlete, you're not going to be able to do it like that. It's going to take time to get in the zone. And then you want to have some time in the zone to maximize that learning. And that's where I come back to those folks on the train. Now, maybe the mass transit here in Minnesota is a little bit nicer than it was in Philly. I don't know. But it seems to me that you know, if you're jammed up against somebody else and rocking back and forth on the train, that's not the best time to try and learn something. You're not going to have the time for it either. All right. A little bit about the content. Most of this talk is going to be about content and the various formats thereof later. But Think about how the content meshes with those other external things. In other words, if you're watching a video, 
am I watching it on a screen that I can actually see? You know, if there's code written in the video, will I be able to read it? And is it a comfortable pair of headphones? If I'm reading a book, am I in a decent chair that's comfortable but not so comfortable I'm going to fall asleep? Think about external resources as well. If you're reading a book and you decide, oh, I'm going to do some practice problems, well, now you have to get up out of that comfortable chair, go in the next room, boot up your computer, and, oh, now I need an OS update. Now you're out of the zone. So spend a little time getting ready, making sure that your environment is the way you want it to be before you start. Now, mental attitude, not one of the externals, but this is going to be key to your learning experience, to engagement. You want to be curious about what you want, want to learn. You want to be excited about that topic because that's what's going to motivate you to drive forward and work on the project. So if you're naturally curious about something and you've picked up some resources to learn about it, great. But what if you're not? What if you have a broader goal? So suppose you want to learn Python. Has anybody ever seen the book Programming Python? It's about 1,600 pages, right? So if you say, oh, I'm going to learn Python, and now I have 1,600 pages in front of me, that's not a great goal. But if you have a reason for wanting to learn it, I want to learn Python because I want to learn more about machine learning. And specifically, I have this project in mind. I want to create a machine learning algorithm that will analyze my music collection and then recommend artists that I might like. OK, that's a very specific goal. And as you're working towards that, not only can you see the goalpost as you're trying to get towards it, each step along the way is going to bring you incrementally closer. And each little step that you accomplish gives you a hit of dopamine so that you can keep going. Whereas if you just say, OK, learning Python is my goal, those goalposts are so far away you'll never see them. All right, so have something in mind that you want to do that will increase your motivation. Sidebar. What happens when the learning isn't your idea, when the goal came from outside? Not an ideal situation, but you can deal with it. First of all, there probably is a goal somewhere. You just didn't come up with it, so you don't know what it is. In the situation where management says, OK, we're porting from JavaScript to TypeScript, why? OK, the product's getting a lot bigger. We've got a lot of. Uh, different files, we've got some people we're bringing in, we've heard that TypeScript is good for maintainability and long-term stability, so that's why we're trying to move to TypeScript. Okay, now you know what the goal is, or you know the, the reason for it. If you agree with that, then you can take that external goal and make it internal. Problem solved. If you disagree with that goal, a little bit trickier. But the first thing you should try and do is keep an open mind. If you're saying, all right, this decision was handed down and I don't think I like it, but maybe there's a reason. Maybe I should go through this process and see if my initial reaction is incorrect. Am I willing to be proven wrong? And if you are, then you go through the process and you come out the end and you can make an honest evaluation. You can say, oh, it turns out I was wrong. TypeScript is a good choice in this particular situation good for us, we're going forward. If not, then you at least have the tools to make an educated argument. You can say, I wasn't in favor of this before. I'm not in favor of it now. I've done the research. These are the three reasons why TypeScript is a bad choice in this situation. That's going to be a lot more persuasive to your manager than just stamping your foot and saying, I don't like it. So do your best you can to keep an open mind. Internalize that external goal. All right, shifting gears, I want to talk a bit about learning styles. Who's heard of learning styles before? A few. OK. For the folks who haven't, this comes from educational theory. So this is one of the few theory spots in the talk. The idea is that everybody has a unique learning style, and that if the instructor can present the content in that particular style, the barriers fall away, and you'll automatically get it. Sounds great, right? The bad news is it doesn't hold up experimentally. Folks who uh, 
on evaluations who were, had learned content in their preferred style actually didn't do any better on tests than people who learn in a non-preferred style. So why am I even bringing it up? Because it's just another barrier. Just like I said, you know, make sure you have a comfy chair to sit in when you read your book, you wouldn't sit on a wooden bench. So why would you choose to learn from a format that's not your preferred learning style? It's not so much learning style as it is learning preference. So that's worth discussing. Now, how many there are and exactly how they break down, that's a subject of debate. Some people say there's as many as 70. Uh, but the standard mnemonic says there's four, V-A-R-K. I'd like to run through them real quick and tell you how these map to learning code, because there may be some surprises in here for you. So the first style is the visual style. Visual style is defined as anything where information relates to other information in space. So charts, graphs, and in the code sense, flowcharts, right? Sequence diagrams, UML, anybody remember UML? I'm just dating myself all over up here. All right, all visual components. So you can see how that applies to code, if not directly. Now the auditory form is something that, you know, that's what you're doing right now. You're taking in information that's presented in an auditory manner. But it goes beyond just the obvious. There's also narrative as part of an auditory form. You'll remember stuff better if it's presented to you as a story. Speaking out loud also is part of the auditory style. Has anybody heard of rubber duck debugging? A couple, oh, a few, yeah, all right. So the idea here behind rubber duck debugging is that if you have a problem with your code, if you can explain it to someone else, articulate it, you might find yourself able to solve it. Because in order to explain it to somebody else, you have to crystallize that idea in your mind. You have to pull out the important pieces. You have to be able to summarize this is what the problem is. Now the duck comes in because normally you would do that by pulling in a colleague and saying, hey, let me explain this to you. Let me just think out loud. And now you've taken your colleague off task. So if you keep a rubber duck on your desk, you can use that instead. Just explain it to the duck instead of to your colleague. Uh, some boot camps and programs even go so far as to give out ducks to all the students. It doesn't have to be a duck. That's a secret. But, well, and that's the point. If you can talk to the duck, then you're stimulating a different part of your brain. You're engaging that audio learning style. Now, reading and writing, when it comes to learning code, that's kind of on the obvious side. But don't discount the writing part. I see some folks here taking notes, which I think is fantastic. Thank you for demonstrating my point. The act of writing engages a different part of your brain, also has a physical component to it. I know for myself, I'm a big note taker. And I'm not taking notes just so a month from now, Brian can you know, read back and remember because my memory's going. The act of taking the notes, again, engages a different part of my brain, helps me to crystallize the topic. What are the important points? What about what's being said was important to me? So writing that down engages with the learning process. And then finally, the K is the, the kinesthetic style. And obviously, on the face of it, this has nothing to do with code, right? Well, the kinesthetic style is also what we call muscle memory. You find it in athletics, you find it in dance, and you find it in the martial arts. And the key component to the kinesthetic style is trial and error and repetition. Starting to see how this sounds familiar? This is relevant to code, right? I know you can't tell it to look at me, but I practiced some martial arts in the past. All right? And when I tried to learn something, I couldn't just watch a video or watch somebody demo it and immediately get it. I had to try it out myself, get it wrong, get corrected by the instructor, try it out again, keep trying until I get it right. And then, once I'd gotten it right, continue to practice until it became muscle memory, until it became automatic, to the point where I would know that, for example, if I throw an elbow, then a back knuckle immediately comes after it. I don't have to think about that. So when you're writing code, if you're learning a new code language, you don't necessarily have to memorize everything in the code or everything in the language. 
You don't have to memorize all the syntax, but what you do want to know is what are the basic techniques for this? What are the basic techniques that I use to solve problems? So that you're not starting from scratch every time. You want to get that muscle memory mentally for how to use the new language, how to use the code. There's a reason that code katas are a thing. Repetition, practice. So, most of these learning styles, it's up to you. If you like video more than you like reading, then do that. If you're a traditional, I like to read a book person, do that. That's personal preference, but the one time, big takeaway number three, where I'm gonna get didactic here, practice is critical. You need that kinesthetic style in your code learning, or else you're not gonna get it. All right. Now that we've talked about the styles, let's talk about the content, where it comes from and how you get it. There's a lot of different formats out there. If I were giving this talk 15 years ago, I would just say, okay, well, go have a book because that's what we do. You learn stuff from books. But it doesn't work that way anymore. There's a lot of new formats and a lot of new ways to get information that you may not be familiar with. So I'm gonna go through them and explain how they map to the styles and give you some tips on how to get stuff. And we're gonna start with books because I'm a book person and reading and writing is my preferred learning style. So obviously, books engage the reading and writing style, sure. Kinesthetic, is there kinesthetic in a book? Yes. Practices, trial and error. So if you think of a traditional textbook, sure, it's got practice exercises at the back of the chapter and then answers in the back of the book. But a lot of other publishers like to leaven the kinesthetic, the practice, in through the book itself. So maybe as you're going along, there's a project in each chapter where you're writing some code. Or maybe there's one big project that goes through the entire book. The key to making that effective for you, and rather than just something you're absorbing passively, is to look for the spots where you can have a jumping off point and see this is how, I can see how this demo that I'm doing applies to my product or something I'm working on. It's pretty common. I, I did a lot of books in the past on uh, the various JavaScript frameworks, and I can't tell you how many times I went through the demo of we're going to build a single page application that recommends movies to you. And that's fine, but you don't want to just have that as the only thing you're capable of doing after you read the book. There should be a spot if the author's doing his job right where you know you can say, oh, I see where I could apply this to my medical billing app that I'm writing or to uh, my reference app that I'm writing. So you want to have that kinesthetic. And there's a little bit of the visual in there because I have yet to find a book that doesn't have some sort of graph or diagram and a content that's explained better visually than in words. So these are where you get books. Obviously, yes, you can go to Amazon but I'm pointing out the publishers specifically because there's some variation between them. These folks on the bottom, Addison Wesley, Prentice Hall, they're traditional academic publishers. They've been around a couple hundred years. If you buy a book from them, it's probably gonna be a textbook, it'll be thicker, it'll be hardback, it'll probably have those formalized practice exercises in each chapter. The folks towards the other end of the list, my own pragmatic, O'Reilly A Press, they're what we call by programmers for programmers publishers. We were founded by programmers, and we generally try and present the content in the way that programmers want. In other words, we dispense with the theory, we dispense with introductory material, we kind of cut to the chase. Because the idea is we want you writing code in each chapter. Now, thank you for reminding me. There's going to be a handful of these slides. If you want to take pictures, these would be good ones to take pictures of. Um, right. So moving on. So video is the next format I want to talk about. And used to be that video was harder to come by, but fortunately now it's 2019 and we all carry video players around in our pockets. There's a couple kinds of video that you're going to run into. The first kind is what I call the traditional studio video. Got a presenter on a stage. There's a camera. It might be a whiteboard behind them. So they're talking to the camera. They might write on the whiteboard. They might have props depending on the content, and then occasionally they'll cut away to a code editor, or they might just you know, write the code on the whiteboard. Expensive, those tend to be, because you have to have the whole studio. 
The other kind you're seeing more often is what's called a screencast. They're a lot easier to make. You're not actually seeing the presenter because there's no camera. You're just recording whatever's on the presenter's screen and hearing the voiceover as they discuss whatever it is they're trying to teach. So in that case, you're looking at the code editor most of the time. The screencast is going to be less about the video and a little bit more reading writing because you're reading the code right off their, their code editor. But again, look for the kinesthetic in these products. Some video products will have formal stopping places broken up into chapters and then will have actual exercises. Other ones will have the examples leavened in throughout, much like the books do. And if you've got a screencast and you're actually following along, you can see what the code is that the instructor is writing and you can duplicate it and modify it for your own use. These are video providers. These vary a lot in terms of the type of content they have. Pluralsight, probably most of you have heard of. Some of the speakers here have been Pluralsight uh, instructors. A lot of .NET at Pluralsight, a lot of JavaScript. Um, front-end masters, as you might imagine, is a little bit more narrow. They specialize in front-end development, JavaScript frameworks, things like that. Some of the stuff in the middle uh, has got a wider variety of content, and some of it has non-tech content. But you're just going to want to check that out. Now, I could have included pretty much all of the book publishers on here as well. Because the book publishers around about 2012, 2013 suddenly looked up and said, hey, our customers are asking for video. Maybe we should start making some. And then turned around and found out that these folks were already there and already doing it. But if you have a favorite book publisher, you may find them doing video as well. All right. This next format is really new. So new, in fact, that it doesn't have a formalized name. I've chosen to call it interactive. The key thing about interactive is that it front loads the kinesthetic experience. It makes the practice the core of the learning process as opposed to just something that you can do at the end of a chapter. Let me show you how that works. So this is a product from a company called Katacode. Katacoda, excuse me. You'd see this in your browser. The stuff on the left there is text, but it could also be video. So that's where your traditional words or video is going to be. The thing on the right is a sandbox or a playground, whatever you want to call it, where you can write code and have it evaluated on the fly in your browser in that container. The, there's a lot of variation in exactly how this is done. Some of the companies will just say, OK, just write in the code, and then we'll evaluate it and see what happens, and then it'll compare the results. Others will give you part of the code, and then you have to fill in parts. Um, others will actually give you a skeleton, and then you can choose what goes in each particular block. And then there's even a few that just give you a project, and you have to fill that out on your own and send it in to one of their experts, which then responds to you. So it's not so much real time. I'm also going to mention just briefly Jupyter Notebooks kind of work like this, if you're familiar with that. To my knowledge, nobody's using Jupyter Notebooks for formal education just yet, although it's a good way of disseminating information, uh, and some people are using it in classes. So here are some of the sources that you can use to get interactives. Um, the last one on the list, Exorcism with their clever name. That's one of the ones that you do the project on your own, send it away, and they'll give you feedback. Katakoda, I just showed you. This list is subject to change without notice. I had to update this slide two days ago because one of the items on this list got bought by Pluralsight. So the video folks are very much looking at this content. One of the key things to remember, though, the content here, it skews towards content that is more easily evaluated in the browser. So therefore, JavaScript, therefore, Python. Um, or anything that's really fairly popular. Because it's so new, there's not a lot of this content out there yet. If you're interested in a language like Elixir or Scala or Lua, you're not very likely to find an interactive for it. But if you're interested in .NET, yeah, you'll probably find something. And the last format I wanted to talk about is training. If you were here on Monday, Tuesday, you've experienced the training. Uh, if you've ever taken a university class or a boot camp, that's training. 
if you've brought an instructor in, a consultant, into your place of work to teach to a, a team or a small group, you've experienced training. That's mostly audio because it's the same format that I'm using right now. A certain amount of reading writing if there's supplemental materials or if you're taking notes. And again, the kinesthetic is probably in there somewhere. A lot of the trainings earlier this week and a lot of uh, formal academic trainings will have spots where you stop and do practice exercises and then hopefully get some feedback right there on the spot. It depends on the instructor and how they've designed it, but you want to make sure that the kinesthetic component is in there. And most instructors know that, and so they'll make sure to get it in there. Now, there aren't clearing houses for training as much as there are for books or video, because a lot of it is uh, geographically limited. So if you want to find a university course, look to your local university. If you want to find a boot camp, look and see where a local boot camp is. Uh, consultants you have to bring in, so the geographic thing is not necessarily a factor there. But there are some uh, providers that specialize in providing course-like experiences, uh, Coursera and Skillshare being a couple of examples. I didn't include the great courses deliberately because they have very little tech content. They've got a lot of very excellent content on a variety of subjects, but not a lot of tech. Um, yeah, Code Academy, um, I can't remember where I had listed them, but I think they're, they're more project-based, so I like to put them with the interactives. Um, one thing that I, I will mention here, though, there are companies that are trying to do what they call online remote training. O'Reilly is doing this a lot, where the instructor is in one spot physically projecting online, speaking to a camera, and the students are somewhere else in the world and taking the course. Now, that's fine, but it limits the back and forth. The big advantage of training is that it's two-way. The instructor can see how the class is doing, can vary the pace, can include more or less information. If you're doing it online and you have the ability to get that feedback from the class, that's fine. But when it becomes strictly one way, that's just a video. All right. So having talked about the formats, how do I know what's right for me? There are a handful of factors that go into choosing a format, very practical stuff, that goes beyond just what learning style do I learn best. So the first is the pacing. This is something to consider. And I don't just mean how quickly can I get through the content. What I mean with pacing is how much control do I have over can I go back? Can I find that thing that I read two chapters ago and, and check that out again? Or I imagine most of us have had the experience of having to read a page three times before you get it. That's also an element of pacing. So for comparison, books and video have a lot of control over the pacing. I give books a slight edge over video simply because books have a 500-year-old UX that we're all used to. In fact, most of us learn how books work and how to use them before we can even read. Not so much with video, although things are changing. But with a book, it's fairly easy to say, OK, I want that information. I know it was a couple of chapters ago. It was on the left, and then you can find it again. Videos, while they also enable you to vary the forward pace, a lot of these providers have their own uh, bespoke video players that can go at 1.5 speed or 2 speed or 3 speed if you're really brave. But actually going back and finding material again, a little bit trickier. The interactives, the pacing is dictated by the exercises. So if you're saying, eh, I feel like skipping the first three exercises and going right to the middle, then you won't have the code from those first three exercises to build on. So the pacing is more limited. In the case of training, that's under, up to the instructor. Now, a good instructor is going to know I should go a little faster, I should go a little slower. But ultimately, it's up to the instructor. It's not up to the consumer. All right want to consider opportunities for practice. If you can't tell, this is a theme for this talk. I want people to be able to practice. So what opportunities do we have to practice? I've already mentioned the interactives make the practice front and center to the experience, so that's important. Training, it's up to the instructor and how they've designed it, but I still think that most good trainers will provide the opportunity for practice. And videos and books are down the other end, not because they don't have as much opportunity for practice, but because there's nothing making you do it. 
It's up to you as the consumer to engage and say, yep, I've reached the end of chapter five, and although chapter six looks really interesting, I'm gonna spend a couple of hours here doing these practice problems. That requires discipline. Hey, I've skipped over the practice problems sometimes too. I don't judge. But you have to, if you want to learn it, if you want to cement it, then you have to make the time, either right then or come back to it later. Equally important with the practice is feedback. It's not enough for the book to say, you know, here's the answer and well, I, I got it wrong. I don't know how that happened. I, it's not making sense to me. You want an opportunity to find out what you're doing wrong, to find out how to improve, how to do it better, so that you can get it on the second try or the third try. And that's where training excels. Ideally, again, because things vary, if the instructor's provided the opportunity for practice and you're working on it and you're not getting it, you can say, hey, help me out here. And if the instructor or an assistant or somebody is able to give you feedback in the moment and say, yep, that's what you did wrong. You did single equals instead of double equals. Don't worry, everybody does that. Then you can keep moving as opposed to banging your head against the wall trying to figure out where you went wrong. Now, the interactives, kind of a special case because they evaluate on the spot and it depends kind of on how they're designed. They might be designed with certain failure states in mind so that if you, say, used a single equals instead of a double equals, then the, the uh, whatever's evaluating your code will know that and can point it out. But that'll only happen if you've picked one of the four or five failure cases that the designer programmed in. If you're like me and gifted in breaking code in ways that no one has ever seen before, you're probably gonna have a little more trouble with the interactive. It won't give you as much feedback. And then books and video are all the way down the shallow end here because they don't offer that opportunity. Answers in the back, sure, but that doesn't necessarily tell you where you went wrong. But caveat to this, a lot of publishers of both books and video will support their products, will offer some sort of feedback form or maybe a forum where people can talk about it. The trick here is scale, though. So if I write a technical book and it sells 5,000 copies, which would make me very happy, and 10% of the people who read it have a problem and write in, that's 500 people that I have to then give an answer to. And the author might not be able to do that in a timely manner. And even worse, the further away in time you get from the initial publication, the less likely the author is still gonna be around to support it. So I don't wanna point at books and video and say, yeah, they have no feedback at all. They may have some, you might have to go looking for it. All right, next factor is cost. Very practical. I work for a publisher, I have heard all of the complaints about the cost of tech books. But what I will suggest to you is that relative to everybody else that we've talked about, books end up on the cheaper end of the scale. Training, obviously expensive, especially if you're flying a consultant from another continent to come speak at your company. Because people don't scale, you're paying for that expertise, it's gonna cost you a little more. The interactives in the video kind of fall in the middle here, because especially in the case of the interactives, a lot of those providers use the subscription model, um, where you're not just paying for a single unit of content or paying for a single course, you're paying a monthly subscription. And yeah, the whole Planet Fitness plan is in full effect here. You pay for it once a month, and whether you use it or not is entirely up to you. So again, as a consumer, you have to motivate yourself, just like at Planet Fitness, and say, yes, I am gonna use this. So books are actually on the cheap end of the scale, because, generally because they're you know, single units. You buy a book, you've got a book, you keep the book. Ebooks are a little bit cheaper than print, so I should point that out. And I will also point out that some book publishers are offering a subscription service as well. O'Reilly Books Online is one of them. And again, you've got the Planet Fitness problem. And the last thing I want to mention is availability. And I don't just mean, is there a bookstore nearby that I can go buy a book? I mean, is there any barrier to entry, any other things that I would need in order to use this learning product? So in that situation, Books are high availability. Like I said, it's a UX we're all familiar with. There are very few people who pick up a book and get confused about how to use it or need anything else. Yes, ebooks do require an ebook reader. I bet you've got one in your pocket, so no problem. 
Videos, again, you're probably carrying that around with you, a video player. However, a lot of the video providers, especially ones with subscriptions, are going towards streaming rather than download, so you'll need an internet connection. Interactives, again, will probably require, require you to be online. And because of that format that I showed you with the, the playground and the split screen, not terribly phone friendly or tablet friendly, so you might want to be actually at a workstation. Slightly less availability. And training, of course, very limited because geography is our enemy here. So you have to go to where the trainer is or bring the trainer to you. OK, enough things to consider. Can I actually make some recommendations? Yes, I will. If your resources are limited, if you have limited cash, limited availability, limited whatever, go with a book or a video, whatever suits your learning style best. Just be aware that the trade-off is you're going to have to take on board some of the motivation to keep going with the book, to do the practice exercises, to keep watching the video. That's your trade-off for a cheaper cost. If you have resources, but you're alone, and most importantly, if the content is available and what you want to learn, I recommend the interactive. Yep, book publisher standing here saying, use something that's not a book. I really like the way that the interactives front load that kinesthetic style, the way they make the practice the center of the experience. So yes, if you've got the resources and if it's available, then do the interactive, because you don't get a choice. You have to do the practice. There's nothing better than that. Now, if you've got resources and you're a group, then I recommend training. Trainers do vary, but shortening that feedback loop, having the opportunity to practice and then having the opportunity to get feedback immediately, that's priceless. So if you have the ability to pay for it and if you have a bunch of people uh, to economize the scale, then yeah, go for training. Now, having given actual hard recommendations, I will now proceed to undercut them. None of this is foolproof. You can have a fantastic trainer with a great reputation who's excellent 365 days a year, or 364 days a year, and then that last day, he's not feeling it, didn't get his coffee, not feeling well, and he has a bad day. Okay, these things can happen. You can pick a book or a video that you thought was going to be great for you, and three chapters in, it's not. So how do you protect against that? Find out in advance. Take a look at reviews. Turns out there's this little-known website that rates every book ever published. It's called Amazon. And they've got these ratings that you can check out. But buyer beware when it comes to Amazon ratings. Just because a book has three one-star ratings doesn't mean it's garbage. Check to make sure that the people doing the reviews are like you. In other words, that they're of similar levels of experience and what they want out of it is similar. Very common in my industry to see a one-star review where the customer bought something that they thought was advanced but it was basic or the other way around. In other words, they bought a book that's not for them. I'm not blaming the customer on that one. That actually constitutes a failure of marketing. If we didn't explain to the customer what's in the book, that's on us. If we did explain it and the customer didn't read it, that's on them. So go beyond the simple number of stars. Get some personal recommendations. If you've got a colleague who's already learned this thing that you're trying to learn, they probably know you pretty well. So they might say, hey, check this book out. It worked for me. I think it might work for you. Or you know, the online community. Try and get some personalized recommendation. You can trust the gatekeepers. I know gatekeeper is a dirty word, but I'm using it here in the sense of publishers and video providers and all of these content providers. We strive to have a consistent experience across the board. We want all of our books to be of similar levels of quality, similar levels of audience needs. So in other words, Look to the publisher, look to the author. If you've got a favorite author and they wrote a book that you really like and now you're trying to learn something else and they've written a book on that, that's a pretty good bet. If they haven't, well, if you like a particular publisher, that's at least a pretty good place to start looking. We try and have that experience be consistent. Check out the free samples. Who doesn't like a free sample, right? 
Book publishers put excerpts on our websites. Video publishers put video excerpts on their websites. Subscription services often have a free first month. Now, if we're doing a book and we give you 10 pages, well, obviously, we're going to try and put our best foot forward and give you some pretty good 10 pages. But if those are the only good 10 pages in the entire book, the customers are going to figure that out. So we try and make sure that the excerpts are representative. So spend a little time with the excerpts. See if the style appeals to you. If there's some practice problems, try it out. See if it works for you. All right. So we've discussed a lot of ways that you can optimize your experience and hope that you have a good one. But nothing's perfect. All right. You've done everything you can. You got your comfy chair. You got the, the product that you think is going to work best for you. And you're several hours in, and you're beating your head against the wall. It's not working. What do I do? Step one, use your debugging skills. Right? Go after that low-hanging fruit first. See where the problem is. Have I optimized all of my externals? You know, am I tired? Am I hungry? Am I, do I have a headache? Has my motivation changed? That's important. You might have thought that you really wanted to learn Python, but you know, after a couple of weeks of learning it, and the more you learn about the language, you find that it's just not hitting the way you want it to. It's all of the design decisions behind Python are just things that you don't agree with. OK, that's going to wreck your motivation and cause you to fall out of that learning process. That could happen. But let's assume happy path for a second here. You've checked all of your externals. You've checked your motivation. You've checked your goals. All of that's in line. You picked a good product. It's not working. This is the point where, remember the foreshadowing from the beginning, the law of two feet? Feel free to walk. That is the last big takeaway from this talk. Avoid the sunk cost fallacy. There is no Xbox achievement for finishing a 1,000-page textbook that you hated just because you bought the thing. And we see this a lot. All right? Find something that works better for you. If you've got a subscription service, that's easy. There's other products there, and you can try out whatever you like. If you've gone and bought a book, yeah, you might be out the 40 50 bucks. Maybe you can return it, donate it to a library. That'd be nice. But go find something that works for you. Find something better. Don't let the content become an obstacle. So before you go quite that far, though, don't be afraid to mix and match. You're going through the book. First eight chapters have been great. Chapter nine, for some reason, you're just not getting it. Maybe there's something else that could help you get through this particular concept better. Maybe it's a different book. Maybe it's a video. But you, know, you don't have to go and outlay that money just to buy a whole other book for one chapter. Go use the internet. Some good questions on Stack Overflow, or maybe there's a Medium article that explains this content the way you need it to be. Maybe it's a reference problem, right? Whatever it is you're trying to learn has complicated syntax. And while you're getting the concepts, you have to keep looking up the syntax. So maybe you just need a reference to sit with you while you watch this video. Don't be afraid to mix and match. Again, just because you bought something doesn't mean that you're locked in and you're stuck with that particular product forever. Last thing I want to mention is a special case, working in groups. This is something that happens a lot when the word has come down from above, yes, you're all going to learn this because we need to make this change. So working in a group is a high risk, high reward scenario. When it goes well, then you have a situation where you can support each other in the learning. If everybody has to read chapter three by Thursday, that gives you motivation to have read chapter three by Thursday. And then I tried the practice problems in chapter three, and I was having a really hard time with it. But you got them, and you had no problem. So maybe you can explain to me where I'm going wrong. There's a phrase that you'll often hear medical students say, um, see one, do one, teach one. It's the teach one component here that's important. If you have mastered the content to the point where you can actually teach it to somebody else, you know you've got it down. So working in a group can benefit both the person who's teaching and the person who's learning. You support each other. You lift each other up with a group motivation. Now, that's the reward part. The risk part is if you have a group member that's not on board, their motivation is bad. They disagree with this decision that came down from above. In fact, their motivation isn't zero, it's negative. That person 
consciously or subconsciously, is going to sabotage the rest of the group. If you have one person in the group who is actively opposed to the learning process, it's going to hurt everybody's motivation. Now, you solve that problem using management techniques, and that's a bit beyond the scope of this talk. But what I want to suggest is, if that's happening in your group, find out quick and do something about it, whatever it is that you need to do. Solve the problem quickly, because ignoring it and hoping that it goes away is not going to bring a recalcitrant member on board. All right. So that's most of the time here. I want to make a couple of recommendations here at the end. If you're interested more in the learning theory, you might want to check out Pragmatic Thinking and Learning by Andy Hunt. This is from Pragmatic. Yes, that's my employer, full disclosure. If you're interested in techniques, not only for learning, but also for making your code writing more efficient, you might want to check out the Pragmatic Programmer. Yes, it's a classic. If you don't know, this is the 20th anniversary edition. It came out in beta yesterday. If you want to buy it, you can check it out at pragprog.com. It'll be available in print at the end of the year. OK. Looks like we've got a little time left. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Last talk of the day. OK. Ah, OK. Good idea. Excellent. So for those who didn't hear, check out your local library for resources. Uh, if you're here or wherever you are, if your library has the opportunity to let you check out books or video, you could check that out. Yes? Ah, excellent. OK. So Front End Masters provides free samples of live streams, right? Oh, watch the whole thing. Excellent. Cool. Thank you. One thing that I learned while doing the research for this is there's always more things. Uh, every talk that I've done, somebody brings up some provider or some format that I hadn't heard of yet. So I'm constantly evolving this, and I thank you for that. All right. Well, we're down at the end. We're a couple minutes early, but I don't think anybody will mind if we end here. Uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you for attending NDC and for coming to the last talk of the day. And I wish you success in all of your learning projects. Thanks.